All right, good morning. Uh, this video is going to be about how to make your own adventures for your own group instead of just relying on modules or stuff that you found online, whatever, running other people's adventures. This one's going to be about making your own. Now, I've already done a video like this uh, once in the past, but uh, looking back on it, it uh, suffered from several things. One of them being that um, it was too general. The more I looked at it, the more I thought, well, yeah, that's that's all good advice, but it's not, uh, it probably won't get somebody who really doesn't know what they're doing, who really wants some real advice, it probably won't give them much in the way of a clue. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, uh, I decided to go ahead and, and make a second video that's going to show you uh, what I do instead of just saying, well, you could do it this way, or some people might do it this way, some people might do it that way. I'll show you what I do. Uh, I'm not going to be sitting down and going through all the little parts uh, so much as just explaining what I have been doing to plan my next game session that is coming up uh, here in a couple of days um, and the process I went through to get there. Uh, and how that, that process took me four or five days of uh, a little bit of it came uh, came to me at one point, a little bit of it came to me a little bit later. Uh, please forgive the uh, poor production quality of this. Uh, my uh, camera on my uh, on my uh, uh, laptop, I'm sorry. Uh, is giving me a lot of fits, and uh, the uh, the video editing software that I've been using is is uh, I've about reached its limits. So I'm going to have to go back, at least on this video, to doing it all on my phone. So the quality is not going to be that great. Um, also, please forgive all the ambient noise out here, all the birds and the traffic noise, and perhaps my dogs if they decide to get rowdy because they're. Are they behind me now? They were behind me a minute ago there. You may not be able to see them, but they may came up, come over and get rowdy a little bit, but I'll just try to ignore them the best I can. Uh, the reason I'm out here, actually, is because it's a nice, warm, sunny day, and that, for me, is a good place to uh, come up with ideas. It's that or in the shower, and I figured it would look a little strange, and it'd also be hard to set up uh, filming in a shower stall. So uh, it seems to me being in a nice, warm, uh, relaxing environment, uh, it's easy for ideas just to come to you. So, uh, I, as I said in the first video, find out your spot where things really, uh, where inspiration really strikes you, and then prime yourself by thinking of what the last thing that happened was, and then maybe what, uh, what some of your primary goals for the next session or upcoming sessions are. You know, um, I'm not talking about making uh, a plan that is super tight and detailed uh, because that's just not going to work. Your players are going to do things you don't expect and you've got to basically follow what they're going to do. You can't just say, nope, nope, you can't go there because I don't have that planned. So you've got to, you've got to be a little loosey-goosey. Now, I'm not talking about a real 100% sandbox where it's just like, okay, I'm, I have some idea of what's out there, go, go to it. Uh, you still, I still think it's a good idea to have some adventuring hooks or to lay down clues using NPCs or just things that they see uh, that kind of pull their interest in a particular direction. I mean, you're not railroading them. You're not telling them you can only go this way. You're saying, hey, look at this. This is pretty cool. You might want to come this way. All right. So now that we've got that out of the way, um, Let's get on to the actual process. Uh, and before I can just dive into that, I've got to explain a few things about my group and my uh, and my campaign, so you'll understand where I where I pulled the little threads uh, for this adventure from that I'm weaving this adventure out of. <clears throat> Number one, the uh, the leader of the group, the head PC in our group, 
is a uh, defiler named Mardalion, and a defiler, for those of you who don't play Dark Sun, is basically a wizard who uh, uses the uh, the life force from the plants and and just life-giving elements in the in the ground around them. Pulls that to power their spells and does it in such a way that it actually kills the uh, the uh, plants and makes the soil barren and turns it into barren ash. So he's a defiler. And this is, by the way, uh, kind of a neutral to evil party. It's not a, not a good party. They're anti-heroes, not heroes. Um, <clears throat> but uh, he started out, and once again, this is a dark sun thing. He started out in the city-state of Tyr as a, uh, as a young man. That's where he was born. That's where we started our campaign. <clears throat> excuse me. He was born as a slave. Uh, excuse me, I'm just looking for my drink, and it looks like I left it inside. He was born as a slave, and uh, when uh, King Kalak was killed and all the slave, slaves were freed because of that, he gained his freedom. Uh, at that time, he was six or seven years old, so that was, well, he was about nine years old. I'm sorry, I misspoke. Uh, so, and it turns out that the man who owned him, he lived on a, uh, on a noble's estate outside the city-state of Tyr. The man who owned him also was his grandfather. His father died in the uh, chaos surrounding Kalak's death, uh, and his mother lived on until uh, for another six or seven years before she died. But his, his grandfather, who never actually claimed him as a grandson since he was illegitimate and born to a slave, but still kind of uh, looked after him a little bit. He, uh, once uh, Mardalion got old enough, who's the name of the defiler, sorry, once Mardalion got old enough, his grandfather <clears throat> instructed him in the ways of defiling. And once he got to, uh, got to be about 16 or 17, <clears throat> excuse me, he started, his grandfather started using him kind of as a fixer to do his dirty work for him. Since there's a lot of intrigue between the noble houses, uh, if Mardalian's grandfather needed somebody to go give a subtle warning to one of the other noble houses, uh, like breaking into the rooms of one of the leaders of a noble house and leaving an item by their bedside so that it could be so that when they woke up they knew somebody had been in their in their room, something like that, you know, that kind of threat, I can get at you. Or he also did some murdering and some uh, kidnapping as well. Uh, was involved in some arson in town, that kind of stuff. So basically he was a bad dude. Uh, his grandfather basically usually sent him to lead a small group. It was like him and two gladiators to go do something. He'd use the gladiators as muscle and he'd be the leader and, and spell support. <coughs> Uh, in general, the idea was about the same as if you've seen uh, Spartacus, Blood and Sand. He was very similar to the character Asher, uh, except for he didn't, he was not a, a would-be gladiator and he didn't uh, have all the, uh, all the uh, drama with the various gladiators, uh, but he was, as far as being, doing uh, his grandfather's dirty work, he was a whole lot like the character Asher was. Mm -hmm. I beg your pardon. Um, and uh, after a while there was a lot of intrigue and eventually his grandfather was accused of being a defiler but his grandfather being a very rich man was able to uh, kind of uh, buy his way through the trial he was able to bribe enough people to, to be found guilty but the uh, noble family who, um, who he'd been giving the most trouble did still have some influ influential Templars on their side and uh, as, as they were leaving, in the carriage they were leaving the trial land, uh, which Mardalion had attended with him, uh, they, um, they were stopped and uh, some defiler ash was planted in the carriage and was discovered. And at that point, uh, Mardalion's grandfather threw Mardalion under the bus and told him not to worry that he'd take care of it. But, threw him under the bus and they hauled Mardalion off, accused him of being a defiler. He was found guilty very quickly and then sentenced to uh, to work himself to death in the iron mines. Uh, when he was being sent to the iron mines, uh, 
Mardellian's grandfather uh, had the uh, had a psionicist basically go teleport him out of out of uh, one of the prison wagons, and then he sent him on uh, to uh, uh, study with one of his grandfather's old compatriots, a defiler named Bell Smith, and that's basically not long after that is where the rest of the party came in. Uh, and I guess I'll go ahead and tell about their first adventure real quickly too because that has to do with what's going to happen here too. Uh, and Bellsmith needed some items. Uh, he sent them to an ancient dwarven, ruined dwarven city uh, to find a, a, a book and a couple other things. And on their way out of that, they had to, they didn't, weren't able to go in the way they came out or they weren't able to come out the way they went in, I'm sorry. And they, they had to follow this long tunnel that eventually went into an old prison that was on the surface in the mountains. <clears throat> Wait for that to pass. And part of going into this prison, there was a curse set on the doorway uh, and it caused anyone who went through it to lose all their hair. So all the party members who were not, uh, there was one Thracarine that it didn't affect since they didn't have any hair. But all the uh, humanoid party members lost all their hair, not just cranial, but their eyebrows, their facial hair, their uh, their body hair, all that. So, uh, and that's important uh, later on because they do look a little different because they no longer have, like for instance, Mardalian before that had, uh, I want to say, shoulder length brown hair. Uh, you know, he had not as heavy as mine, but he had some decent eyebrows going on and uh, and maybe a, like a two-day beard like I've got right now. I didn't necessarily have a mustache, but he looks like quite different right now. Um, and actually, I'll go ahead and carry on because the next part is important too. Uh, not long after they got back from that and they, uh, they gave the uh, things they were supposed to retrieve to Bell Smith, they went ahead and headed on north for a little while because he didn't have, uh, have anything he wanted them to do right away. They headed on north for a little while and they stopped in this village called Tolomac. And for those of you who know about Dark Sun, uh, Tolomac is not on the Dark Sun map because it is a, a village, fortified village that uh, one of my older parties uh, back in the 90s uh, had, once they got powerful enough and got a bunch of them got followers, they had built basically to house their followers and to be their base of operation. <clears throat> well, while they were there, Mardalian decided he was going to try to buy like some spell scrolls and uh, maybe some spell components. And in making inquiries, he ran into the, uh, the local Veiled Alliance chapter and had a back alley meeting with him. Well, once they realized he was a defiler, uh, they attacked him and uh, this was when he had just got his lightning bolt spell, hadn't used it yet and was itching to use it. So he lightning bolted the crap out of several of them. Uh, just as soon as he defiled, the, uh, the local druid showed up and um, <clears throat> she was actually one of the old party members that I was now playing as, a, as an NPC and she's quite powerful. She showed up and uh, it was gonna be a probably going to be a total party kill if they didn't dock their way out of it or sucker punch her. Well, they sucker punched her and they got the hell out of Dodge real quick before anything could happen. All right, so that's some of the some of the uh, party's history. Now, as far as the condition that the party's in right now, um, there are two <clears throat> there are two PCs in the party that are uh, gladiators that are high enough level to have uh, followers right now. Well, those gladiators uh, have not yet had the opportunity for their followers to show up because uh, neither of them have, up to this point, actually in-game appeared in an arena. Uh, plus, uh, they've set up their uh, base of operations in that ancient dwarven prison and it's hidden in the mountains and nobody knows about it, so, you know, it wouldn't make sense for a bunch of uh, uh, a bunch of people to show up as followers there when it's a, a secret base that nobody knows about. So I'm going to have them actually have to go to a city, uh, <clears throat> be in an arena match that thousands of people see, and then after that, 
because of their performance, uh, there's going to be these guys that are going to be like, oh, we want to, we want to have you show us. We want you to train us. We'll uh, we'll work for you if you'll if you'll train us. So, uh, and the last uh, the last game session ended with them within sight of the city state of Tyr. So that kind of gets you caught up. I think that's everything you need to know. Let me think. Yeah, I believe that's it. That gets you caught up on the campaign as far as what I used, the the elements that I that I drew upon to plan this next session. Okay, I plan the session not by sitting down and and uh, writing out a, a a flow chart or an outline or anything like that. It's mainly just by letting ideas come to me. Uh, in a nice warm spot like this, or in the shower, or while I'm driving, or wherever they happen to strike me. If I've got a spare second, the, an idea may pop into my head. And uh, the big, the really big thing that I wanted to make sure that happened, if it could, unless the players just decided to completely do a 180 and uh, and go in and, and completely the opposite direction I expected, uh, I wanted to make sure that the PCs got their followers. If they survive, they get their followers. Um, I also uh, wanted to, not this session, but probably next session or the session after, get them to their uh, to their home base because uh, Mardalion, uh, uh, a couple of months back in game time, uh, the party found a deck of many things and one of the things he got out of it was the one where you draw and you get like an 18 charisma and a keep. Well, I've already got the keep drawn out and everything for him, but it's, uh, I eventually want to get them to that. So those are my, kind of my, uh, uh, short to medium term goals here that I'm working with. Okay, so the first one is easy. I, I put them, I, I had them come out from uh, what they were doing in their last session near the city state of Tyr. So they're near a city that has a gladiatorial arena. Oh my, what is that? That has a gladiatorial arena and is, uh, and is, uh, uh, and does have games. So I'm going to put them in there. I'm going to have them uh, give them the option of joining the games uh, so you know there's going to be when it comes to going to town from where they are now which is just a few miles from Tier to the gate I'm not going to bother with slowing things down by by having an encounter so I'm just going to have the standard coming into town stuff you know the being stopped and and briefly questioned by the guards but since it's not a time of war they're not going to give them too much crap just standard questions. Coming in, describing the hustle and bustle of the city, describing the the city skyline with the ziggurat and the, and the arena and the golden tower and and the mountains in the distance behind it. Uh, uh, describing just in general some of the uh, some of the things that are near the gate and what what they see as they walk around, and maybe letting them uh, well definitely letting them do what they want, but. Uh, not encouraging them to, to do anything in particular uh, for a little while, you know, just kind of let them soak in the city for a little while. Uh, have a couple of, I'm going to have a couple of NPCs, uh, maybe, a, oh, they've got a name for it, it's a Drachman or something like that. Somebody who basically stands near the gate and sees people come in that are obviously foreigners and says, hey, hello, you look like you need somebody who knows their way around, you know, to kind of show them this and that. Um, just to have somebody for them to talk to instead of it just being like oh and you see this and you see that and you see the other thing it can be somebody who can actually be having a conversation back and forth with them and give them an opportunity for some role playing so there'll be that uh after a little bit of that uh depending on how much it seems like they're really into that uh i'm going to uh give them an opportunity to uh find some place to stay and eat and I'll probably signal that it's time for that just by describing where the sun is in the sky, you know, that it's starting to get late, that the sun's setting over the mountains kind of thing. 
thing. And either during the time that they're out in the streets or after they get their rooms and they're down in the, uh, in the dining hall of the inn that they're in, uh, I'm going to have uh, people uh, talking about the upcoming uh, gladiatorial tournament, you know, and how there are people excited about that. And that will be the hook for the, for the gladiators. There are only two gladiators that are going to be getting um, followers, but there are three gladiators in the party, so all three of them will probably enter. Uh, although they may keep the other one back just as to make sure they've got plenty of muscle with the party. I don't know. We'll see. See how they go. So, uh, and if they're, if they don't really get hooked until they're eating, I've already decided I've got a, uh, uh, a gladiator character, Freeman Gladiator, who's going to be in the dining room and be loudly bragging about his prowess and about how well he's going to do in the tournament. And I figure that will uh, encourage them to uh, verbally spar with him a little bit and there may be a challenge thrown down to, well, we'll see you on the, we'll see you on the arena sands kind of thing. You know, I'll look for you in the arena. Uh, and that should really set the hook. Okay, Mr. Yellow Jacket, go on. That should really set the hook uh, to get the gladiator players into the arena. You know, although I don't think that it will require a whole lot. <clears throat> Excuse me, I don't think it will require a whole lot in the way of uh, of. Uh, antagonizing them or anything to motivate them because like I said they've never played uh, they've never actually played an arena match in game so uh, they're probably already eager for that uh, even if I didn't say anything they'd probably say hey I want to go to the arena and see when they uh, when the next games are I want to see if I can get in on it <clears throat> oh pardon me I wish I had my drink with me but I'd left it inside all right um, The next day, I'm going to go ahead and uh, remind them about that so that they will uh, go out and sign up, get their name on the rosters, and I'll probably give them a day or two, depending on the feel of where we're at, how long it has taken to that point in the game session. I'll probably give them a day or two before the game starts that they can wander around, explore the city, maybe get into trouble, maybe get involved with uh, various groups there like a Thieves Guild, the Veil of Alliance, have a little trouble with various Templars, maybe get recognized, especially Mardalion, by a Templar or potentially recognized. You know, somebody's like, I don't know, I've seen that guy somewhere, I don't know. Um, although I don't want to get them in too much trouble with Templars because them being a... What are you doing, Cypress? Them being a uh, extremely powerful party, I mean they're not they're not like gods or anything, but they they range from about seventh to twelfth level, and there's NPCs and everything. There's about ten of them, although there's about to be nine of them because one of them's leaving. But still, they're a very powerful party. They can throw a lot of smack down. Uh, so I really don't want to have, you know. A garrison of the Tyrian army and 50 Templars come crashing down on them like a hammer, which is what's going to happen if they get into a uh, into a fight uh, with a Templar, unless they uh, immediately make themselves scarce. If they stand, if they stand their ground, you know it'll be I fought the law and the law won. But during that time, uh, I've went ahead. They luckily have an accessory that was put out. Um, in 94 or 95, I don't remember which, called the City State of Tyr. And in it, there are all manner of NPCs and, uh, and locations and organizations and stuff like that that I, can, that I can have them run into as they wander around the city if they choose to do so. Who knows? They may just say, ah, nope, we're going to rest up in our rooms. We're just going down to, uh, we're just going down to, uh, um, get our meals and 
Heck, there's a couple of places that are, if they want to spend the money, that'll even bring their meals to them. So if they're just wanting to skip time and get on to the games, then, you know, we won't do any of that. But if they want to do a little city exploring, I'm ready for that because of that. I'm going to go ahead and, uh, on my hit point sheet, have uh, uh, put a couple of thieves, uh, maybe a half dozen little standard thugs, uh, a Templar and his patrol, um, you know, just stuff like that that they might get into combat with. I'm going to have that written down on my hit point sheet just, uh, just in case they... Uh, they do happen to decide to uh, to talk with their swords instead of their mouths. So that'll then eventually bring me to the arena, the day of the tournament. And this is where I ran into some problems in my planning. It took me three or four days, three days I think, to finally come up with something that I was really satisfied with here because it's obvious what two or three of the players are going to be doing. They're going to have uh, a character involved in matches uh, in the arena. They're gladiator characters. So it's, you know what they're going to do, but I don't want the other, let's see, I got what, uh, I don't want the other two or three, depending on how many, if whether or not the lower level gladiator gets involved. I don't want the other two or three uh, players to just basically be sitting up in the stands with nothing better to do than to listen to the uh, um, listen to the results of the combat and maybe place a bet every once in a while. So I got to thinking about, okay, well, what what can they be doing? And I was like, okay, well, they they could be doing betting, and there could be an issue with a with a bookkeeper or something like that. And I got to thinking, eh, that's not real exciting. You know, that's still not very, very exciting. Uh, and also, that could lead to combat in the stands, which once again could quickly lead to dozens of uh, guardsmen and or Templars cracking down on them quickly. And the same, uh, <clears throat> the same problem uh, occurred to me when I was thinking about, well, maybe they run afoul of a Templar. You know, I really don't want them to uh, have, while they're in the city state of Tyr, to have the entire Templar organization looking for them. Uh, since they're the whole point in them coming here, at least as far as I'm concerned, is to gather a large number of people and leave uh, and have fun while they're doing that. You know, that's the whole goal there. Um. <coughs> So, uh, you know, I thought about it for several days and, and just was not coming up with a, with a satisfactory, uh, with any sort of satisfactory uh, outcome. Everything, as I thought through it, everything that, uh, that occurred to me seemed to have a big problem. And then I got to thinking about, well, what about the Veiled Alliance? And at first, I was thinking, once again, that may be a problem. You know, if they have some sort of run-in with the Veiled Alliance in the days prior, and then they have an issue there at uh, <clears throat> in the stands that could get ugly quick and plus the Veiled Alliance is a clandestine organization so they're not all about doing big flashy things out in public usually they're more about doing things that are hard to trace back to them <clears throat> but the uh, then the thought occurred to me, well, hey, there were the guys from the Veiled Alliance back in uh, Tolemac. And there were a couple of survivors of that. So maybe one of them, since that cell was pretty much uh, uh, broken, maybe one of them decided to come to Tyr and recognized uh, Mardalion and some of his group uh, <clears throat> when they were out in the streets maybe saw them when the gladiators were signing up for the match and decided that they were going he was going to get his revenge since he knew one that you know he had killed his buddies that the Mardalion had killed the guy's buddies and two that Mardalion was definitely a defiler since he saw the ash and all that after the lightning bolt was cast <clears throat> so and also three that he's not uh, 
that he is a very dangerous man. His friends are very dangerous, and they don't want to confront him directly. So I got to thinking, well, how might that guy try to get his revenge, put a stop to Mardalian, whatever? And I got to thinking, hmm, maybe he'll poison him, try to poison him anyway. So maybe he will disguise himself as a vendor, uh, like a food vendor or a drink vendor, you know, kind of like the hot dog vendors at a, uh, at a baseball game or whatever, going around through the stands with his little, his little tray of food or his, his jug of wines, you know, several, several different wines with a little cup, something like that. Um, and he'll go up to Mardalion and, and offer him something that is poisoned. Uh, also, I figured that somebody like that, the Veiled Alliance, is, is uh, all about planning and backup, that he would have people in the stands that would help him. You know, there might be a thief or two or maybe a couple of fighters uh, nearby just in case things get bad. He's got a little backup. He might have people waiting uh, near places where he's going to have to turn and go out of sight that will just walk in the way um, at a bad time, you know, maybe like a, a half giant that will walk in front of a tunnel that he goes down and act like he's talking to somebody else and, you know, give the guy a few seconds to get away if he's, if he's made, that kind of thing. So I figured, you know, that might be interesting. Uh, I'm not just going to have uh, Mardalian be poisoned and not have an opportunity to uh, do anything about it other than make his poison save either. Uh, Mardalian's got a pretty good memory because he's got a fairly high intelligence, so I'm going to give him a chance to recognize this guy. But there's a problem with that. If he recognizes, if I say roll an intelligence check, Mardalian's player will know something's up. He'll be like, hmm, I don't know about this guy. So as the guy is walking up, I'm going to describe the guy walking up and something else going on. Uh, I am still working on what that something else is. I've got two or three possibilities. But some other commotion going on that an intelligence check might be called for during that time. So if he makes it, of course, I'll automatically say, hey, the guy walk the for the food vendor walking towards you uh, seems familiar to you. Uh, he looks a lot like uh, one of the guys who was in the alley when when you killed all those Veiled Alliance people. Uh, and then, you know, things can be played out from there. But if he doesn't make it, you know, then there's the possibility that it was the other thing and he won't automatically be suspicious of... Uh, he won't automatically be suspicious of the guy coming up to me. So that way he has an opportunity not to take the poison, uh, but I don't give away that it's coming either unless he makes his safe. So from there on out, the session gets, uh, gets to be a whole lot less uh, uh, structured and a whole lot more amorphous because there's a whole lot of ways that the, the day's events could end there. You know, there could be uh, characters who die or are severely hurt uh, in the in the uh, down in the arena, uh, which is entirely possible. I'm not going to pull any punches. If they get killed, they get killed. The arena is a dangerous place. That's of course that's true of everywhere on Athens. If they get killed, they get killed. Um, you know, Mardalian could be poisoned. Somebody else in the group could be poisoned uh, and either dead or uh, severely hurt by it. Because I think Mardalian has a total of 25 hit points, and the poison I'm planning on using is 20 hit points or death. So if he takes it, he's taken at least 20 hit points, so he'll, he'll be down to five. Um, so, and that's, I want to say class C or E poison, I can't remember, I'll have to look. But, uh, so, you know, even if things go well and everybody leaves uh, the arena in, uh, in relatively good spirits, there are still things that may have happened in the days before that, that will come to fruition <coughs> during the time after, uh, after the uh, tournament. 
you know, if one of them happens to win the tournament or do really well in the tournament, you know, that can, that can change the outcomes too. Hush! Okay, I'll just talk over them, I guess. The, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, and if, uh, you know, it, even if things do go really well, there's the, okay, what do they do, uh, what do they do after? They're going to have followers show up the next day where they're staying. Uh, then they're going to have to figure out the logistics of housing those followers. Are they just going to do like they normally do and go marching across the desert and do that with 125, I think it is, followers between the two of them coming with them? Uh, are these guys, you know, they're going to have to buy these guys rations at the very least and, and enough water. Or are they going to go buy a couple of the really large caravan wagons and load everybody up in them and and uh, take them? <clears throat> and there there's issues with that because of impassable terrain for a caravan wagon in between where they are and where they're going. You know, are they going to have each guy carry a, uh, a pole, you know, let's say five or six feet long that has a bunch of leather rolled up on it and some... And some uh, leather lacing so that they can build a uh, so they can drive the poles in a in a circle and build some sort of perimeter as they camp and then are they going to buy everybody tents you know there's just a, a lot from there on out that could possibly happen plus depending on how fast we get through it uh, I'm I'm probably going to roll up two encounters after they leave Tier as well um, <clears throat> just in case they get to that so that it's not like, okay, I don't have anything else planned. Uh, so, but that's pretty much uh, what I have done to plan this, uh, this next session. That gives you an idea. So I'm going to go ahead and let you go because it sounds like one of my neighbors is out and riling up my dogs. So I'm going to go tell them to shut up and uh, I will uh, be back pretty soon with another video um, probably about when to uh, when to uh, uh, hand out experience to your players and leveling up will probably be the next video so look for that uh, please like this uh, video and share it sharing helps a whole lot believe me it keeps me from having to do all the legwork putting it out um, <clears throat> also uh, if you do like this video, please subscribe. Uh, and if you do subscribe, please hit the uh, bell icon because subscription doesn't work the way it used to. Now, if you want to be notified, you have to hit the bell icon. So, uh, okay, I don't know what my neighbor is doing. I'm going to go ahead and let you go. Uh, have a great day. Bye.